Hi everybody, Dr. Pingel here. Um, we're going to be doing a um, lesson here on visualizing 3D scenes with photogrammetry. Uh, so photogrammetry is uh, not new. Um, photogrammetry is um, actually quite old. It's probably about as old as photography itself. Um, some of the initial uh, uses of photogrammetry uh, dating way back to the 1800s were um, taking photographs from balloons. Um, and those were quickly adapted to military purposes. And so the idea of photogrammetry is really just uh, making real world measurements from photographs. Um, and uh, the physics of this are actually pretty, um, pretty well understood. Uh, there aren't a lot of surprises. Um, so ca the cameras record images in, in uh, a very uh, entirely predictable way. And that means it's actually pretty easy to recover metric information uh, from a photographs, uh, from a photograph, meaning like uh, the, the what you're seeing is is a real reflection of um, what the object is, um, and we can do this in two ways. One, we can uh, compare portions uh, within an image uh, to make estimates of size. So even if we just have a a single image, that's often quite useful uh, in terms of uh, being able to make measurements. Uh, obviously, you can have some distortions. There are some really good examples of this. Uh, you can see one right there. Um, so within image judgments are sometimes prone to error. Um, uh, so oftentimes we'll make comparisons between two images. Um, <clears throat> and those will, those will help us really accurately uh, judge distance and size. Um, typically the way that this has been done is with a stereo pair uh, of images. Uh, and so this is done either with two cameras uh, or obviously biological systems tend to have two eyes. Um, each one of those sensors records a position, and then a comparison between those two images allows you to make some pretty good judgments about three-dimensional um, structure. Um, so the, the quality of that three-dimensional reconstruction, uh, or if you want to just think of this as like depth perception, but it really goes much deeper than that, uh, the, the quality of that depends on a couple of things. Uh, one is how much overlap there is between images. So if only one image can be deceptive, then you can only really make a good judgments um, where there is overlap. Uh, that's not exactly true. Um, you can use the information between those pairs to, to make some good inferences, but, but mostly that's true. The better, uh, the more overlap there is, um, the more accurate that that 3D construction, reconstruction is gonna be. And so this leads to a, a sort of um, famous distinction between um, predator animals and prey animals. Prey animals tend to have their um, eyes located on the sides of their heads with very little overlap, uh, and that lets them have a, a wider field of view um, predators tend to have their eyes uh, on the same side um, with a lot of overlap, letting them make better uh, distance judgments. Um, the other thing that uh, is going to make a big difference uh, with respect to uh, the quality is the, the baseline or the distance between the two sensors. And the wider that distance is, the better overall um, your judgment is going to be. Um, because that's what's going to create the, uh, the parallax or the difference between images that's going to let you make the judgments. Um, you can imagine if the eyes were perfectly overlapping exactly in the same position, then you're getting no extra information. Uh, and so the wider that distance, the more information you're going to get. And then the last thing is the resolution of the sensor. So as the um, number of megapixels in your image gets better, um, if your visual acuity gets better, um, then your 3D reconstruction is going to be better. Um, now, typically, we tend to think of these things as, uh, as kind of uh, uh, greatly important, right? So the, uh, the stereo pair is what gives us three dimensionality. And that's true. Um, two eyes uh, certainly uh, make a big difference there. Um, but obviously humans uh, or any animal doesn't lose their entire ability to make three dimensional judgments with only one eye. Um, we still do a pretty good job with that um, because we can make comparisons between sequential images. Uh, and so if we, uh, if we uh, you know, take two uh, photographs in time and just move uh, between them, then that's functionally doing the same thing as having two. Uh, and so one, one eye uh, still works fairly well. Um, <clears throat> as a matter of fact, most of the, um, most of the uh, topographic mapping that was done back in the day uh, was done with the stereo images. So prior to that, they would send surveyors out uh, with, uh, with a plane table and, and manually sort of um, extract ground points. Um, but when the advent of uh, good quality cameras and aircraft, um, it became possible to do wide area surveys. And so this was done uh, in the 50s and 60s, particularly lots of aircraft flights uh, over, uh, especially the Western United States, gathering a lot of information 
um, that wasn't there. Uh, and so um, these uh, uh, network of ground control points uh, was established. This, this was usually done by manual survey, uh, but then those ground control points could be used to georeference uh, or attach real world coordinates to the measurements that were derived. Um, there are still plenty of good tools um, to do just single stereo pair comparisons and extractions. Uh, ArcGIS has some of these. And so if you're interested in that, um, feel free to, uh, to play around with those. Um, the big change, though, uh, is, uh, is with uh, the advent of digital photography, um, which uh, makes it easy to do start doing computer vision projects. Um, so up until probably about the, the mid 90s or so, uh, film was still dominant, uh, analog, um, analog images were by far more common, um, but digital cameras started to get more uh, popular. Um, and that led us, uh, that gave us the ability to start analyzing those digital images um, quite readily with computers. Uh, and so the field of com computer vision predates that digital photography for sure. Um, but I would say that it really started getting big um, at the time that, uh, that uh, digital, digital input uh, became possible. Um, so computer vision is the sort of the process of, of uh, designing computer algorithms to automatically recognize features and scenes and objects and pieces and portions of images. Uh, and so this is just an easy example of um, uh, an algorithm that's been designed to detect cars uh, in an image. There are lots and lots and lots of applications for this. Um, so probably one of the most common is face identification and recognition. Uh, so face identification is just saying, is there a face in this image? Face recognition is sort of using key points that are um, uh, referenced within an image to try to figure out um, who that is and to maybe match images. So the Facebook, fa uh, Facebook algorithms that can sort of automatically tag your friends are examples of this. Uh, panorama generation is another example. Um, so this is the ability to stitch sequential images together um, to make a larger image. Uh, the field of view of many cameras is actually fairly small, uh, and so if you kind of move your camera around, you can generate a much larger picture. Uh, gesture recognition is another one. Um, so uh, being able to sort of see what your hands are doing. Um, uh, there have been a lot of advances in trying to get use hand input gesture recognition um, to, do, uh, to do work for human-computer interaction. And then object tracking, like we saw in the, in the previous example, cars uh, being identified and, and tracked uh, through sequential frames. Uh, panoramas are, are a particularly good bridge um, to talk about some of the things that we're interested in. Um, so uh, panoramas uh, are pretty easily constructed. In fact, uh, I would say most uh, cell phone uh, photo apps uh, are able to do this by default. Um, it's just a setting you turn on and you wave your camera around and uh, pretty much instantaneously you get a, a panorama. Uh, back in the day, I used to have to do this uh, manually. <laughs> so. Uh, you'd take a picture with your film camera. You'd take several pictures, kind of move your camera around as you did it, and then you'd uh, and then you'd physically chop them up and, and tape them together. <clears throat> uh, of course, we don't do that anymore. Um, uh, the apps on your phone will do a perfectly good job of creating panoramas. Um, I also use software um, to do this kind of post hoc. So if you uh, want to do this with images that you're going to capture from a drone, which is what we're going to talk about here in a second. Um, one of the really, really easy things that you can do is just use Image Composite Editor, which is a Microsoft program that's free. Um, and there are a ton of good options, and you're going to get a chance to explore this program a little bit in your notebook. Um, uh, it's a really fantastically useful, um, useful little program. Uh, if I'm doing any custom work, um, I'll use something called OpenCV, which is uh, the uh, open source computer vision library. Uh, there are... Um, uh, ways to hook this into all kinds of other languages. You can uh, get it into C++ or Python or Java. You can use Windows, Linux, Mac, um, Android. Uh, this is really the basis for most um, uh, open source computer vision um, applications that get developed. It's extremely powerful um, and really, really easy to use. Uh, so if you're into programming at all and interested in this stuff, um, I would encourage you to give OpenCV a look. Um, the, the big capabilities for um, developing three-dimensional models um, really kind of started in the mid-2000s. Um, so this was uh, uh, some folks out of the University of Washington that sort of did the, the groundbreaking work in this. Uh, and the idea was is that um, we can essentially uh, put pictures together um, by finding key points uh, in an image. So figuring out what the top of that peak is, where that tree is, uh, through a variety of algorithms to sort of break the image down. Um, automatically reg register those two images. So without a human being going in and say, this is that feature and this is that other feature, 
the algorithm can find uh, common points uh, in both images automatically. And what that lets you do is, is detect um, how the camera has moved uh, between images. And uh, this lets you um, uh, create a three-dimensional model essentially from all of the pixels that you can co-register between images. Uh, this project was called Photosynth, um, and it was up online. Uh, you can also download it. Uh, Microsoft put this out, and it was up online for a while. Um, uh, unfortunately, finally discontinued in 2017. Some of those features have been built into other things like the Image Composite Editor uh, and their new Pix app. Um, we'll see if it uh, has any more of a resurgence uh, going forward. Um, around this time period, uh, there were some other um, really interesting uh, ideas. So Microsoft developed uh, the Kinect, uh, which is a, uh, a sensor that essentially has a couple of video cameras on it. Um, some very nice hardware that starts to do the, the 3D registration uh, between those gathered images and, and is able to create what's called a depth image, um, which is sort of a predecessor to a point cloud. Uh, those depth images allow it to essentially see in three dimensions. Um, and so uh, originally this was, was designed for games uh, and it could do gesture recognition. It could sort of figure out how you were moving around. And then, uh, uh, but uh, later some researchers and scientists started sort of bootstrapping the Kinect into a, uh, into a three-dimensional scanner. And so there's a, a number of different software projects that kind of emerged out of this time period. Um, one that I had played around with is called the Scanect, um, which is still live. Um, it doesn't really rely so much on the, uh, the Kinect hardware anymore since that's getting pretty old. Um, uh, instead, what it relies on is, is this. Uh, this is the uh, Intel RealSense, which is essentially a, a version of the Kinect. You can see that it actually looks quite similar. It's got a couple of onboard cameras. Uh, some of those cameras, by the way, are infrared, um, which helps with, um, with registration. Uh, and so, uh, and so uh, the, the new technology that's kind of built around using photographs to, uh, and hardware to automatically create a point cloud is based on technology like this. Uh, there are plenty of other applications of these sort of vision-based systems to do things. Uh, the field of computer human uh, human computer interaction, HCI, is um, basically uh, you know designing and looking at different inputs and outputs for the computer to, to better enable human beings to interface with uh, with their data uh, and uh, their their work. Um, the one on the left is what's called a, a, a leap motion controller. Um, so this is a couple of cameras that are in kind of a near field arrangement that you put in front of your computer. Uh, some of these have actually been built into laptops, uh, but you can sort of wave your hands in, in front or on top of that sensor. Uh, the sensor is is uh, creating a, a reconstruction. And so what you see there is a reconstruction of that uh, person's hands on the computer screen based on the imagery that it's capturing from that sensor. Uh, another big one right now is uh, the Oculus Rift. So the Oculus Rift comes with a, a couple of sensors that are essentially cameras on sticks. Uh, you put these sensors in a room. Uh, and again, through comparison between those two images, you're able to um, you're able to uh, make judgments about um, what kind of a structure is moving around in the room. So you you have these hand controllers that that you can use to 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 create hand motion. So all of the fine details are done through sort of a, a, a controller, um, but your movement through the room is tracked with these um, these pairs of cameras. Uh, this is kind of a fun one. Uh, this is uh, uh, one of uh, one example of many products. Uh, this one has a suite of uh, cameras essentially built into it and in, in the shape of a ball and some hardware that is going to stitch all those things together, uh, essentially building a, a full 360 degree panorama um, on the fly. So these things are kind of fun. Uh, there's some YouTube videos that you can check out sort of seeing how people use these things. You throw them up in the air and they can um, they can detect quite a lot. Uh, of course, kind of the big advancements have been coming around with um, with drones. Uh, so drones, uh, more formally known as unmanned aerial vehicles or um, unmanned aerial systems, um, look something like this. This is an example. Uh, this is a Mavic 2 um, uh, by DJI. Uh, and the, the, the really kind of breakthrough in this is sort of the, the, the confluence of technology that um, sort of miniaturized GPS systems, um, some really good algorithms and some hardware. Uh, that came about uh, in the form of what are called flight controllers that allow for the uh, drone's position to be uh, really finely controlled. Um, so those things got very cheap and good. Um, and, uh, and essentially those were all packaged together. Uh, and around that time, the digital, uh, digital cameras got a lot better. Uh, and all of these um, things kind of came together. Uh, and just within the last five, 10 years, um, the price has just been getting driven down, down, down uh, on all of these. Uh, what used to cost 
uh, many tens of thousands of dollars 10 or 15 years ago, you can buy for a couple of hundred dollars now. So um, the, the rapidity with, with which um, these things have, have come to market is pretty astounding, really. Um, the, uh, we were not going to get too much in the mechanics of how these things fly. Um, uh, and uh, I, should, I should at least mention uh, that while it's pretty common uh, for small scale mapping to be done with uh, with units like this, this is a quadcopter, meaning there are uh, four rotors. There are plenty of other um, examples of uh, kinds of drones. So you can have three drone or three rotor drones. You can have six rotor drones, eight rotor drones. Uh, and of course, you can have fixed wing drones, uh, which uh, uh, don't have propellers. And then they've been making some hybrids that can sort of do uh, vertical takeoff and landing, uh, but can also fly like an aircraft. So those are by far the most efficient. Um, the, um, the camera is um, hugely important, uh, and so uh, this particular unit, uh, the, the DJI Mavic, has a 20 meg megapixel camera um, mounted on what's called a gimbal. Uh, so the gimbal is what allows the camera to be um, pointed in flight, but more importantly, uh, it allows the um, computer to automatically correct for um, how the aircraft is moving. So if the um, uh, if the drone banks or, or yaws or rolls, um, the uh, camera is basically set to make, auto or the gimbal automatically makes corrections. Um, and so the camera is kind of held at a fixed position. Uh, so that's basically like a steady cam like they've been using in Hollywood for a long time. Um, but, this, uh, but this gimbal uh, really makes the quality of the photographs better um, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the output. Uh, it essentially decouples the camera from the, the flight of the drone. Um, the DJI has a built-in camera. Um, many of the, uh, the drones uh, on the market will use something called, or, uh, or open source, uh, sorry, not open source, we'll use uh, off-the-shelf uh, cameras. So GoPro cameras is, is really popular for this. Uh, they tend to be compact, uh, pretty rugged, um, often waterproof. Um, they also have relatively high resolutions um, and especially good frame rates. Um, so a lot of these new GoPro cameras can capture 4K video at 60 frames per second, which makes for really high fidelity video. Um, video is not hugely popular for mapping. Um, we tend to use um, smaller photographs to do that. Uh, a lot of the image, uh, a lot of the data from video tends to be redundant. Um, and so, uh, but it is, it is very nice for, uh, for other reasons. Uh, probably the, uh, the biggest consumer drone right now is the, uh, the DJI suite of drones. Uh, so uh, my lab uh, just recently acquired one of the Mavic 2s, um, uh, and uh, these things are uh, uh, the other. So the Mavic is kind of one big class of these. Um, the Phantom is is a second big class, um, <clears throat> a little bit a um, little bit lar larger, um, uh, longer flight times. Uh, but the Mavic 2 has a has a flight time of about half an hour, um, so that makes uh, that makes using it uh, pretty nice in the field. Um, DJI has an exceptional um, sort of design. Uh, these things are super lightweight. Um, that they're they're really easy to fly and use. They're built-in uh, controls with cameras. Um, just a really really nice um, system uh, overall. Um, however, uh, there's a whole other sort of class of drones out there, um, sort of the open source community. This is kind of where things got started. Um, so it's uh, you know again. A couple of individuals kind of um, have made a big difference in the advancement of drones. Uh, and a couple of key components here. Um, one is the flight controller. Uh, so at right there, this kind of boxy black thing is a PixHawk 2. Um, uh, the PixHawk kind of program is, is sort of a, an open source uh, community that sort of de designed the software and the hardware for these things. Um, that makes them cheap. It makes them easy to get a hold of. It also makes things uh, sort of infinitely customizable. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually fairly easy to design and build your own drone. Um, there are 3D printable drones. Uh, there are kits out there that you can get. Um, and you can sort of design uh, everything from the ground up. They tend not to have the, a very slick um, appearance to them, uh, like the DJI Mavics do. Uh, sort of really, really nice um, ergonomic design. These things tend to be a little bit more rugged and workhorsey. Um, but they're also uh, infinitely configurable. And so uh, you can design, using this stuff, you can design drones that uh, can lift, you know, dozens of pounds, can fly for an hour. Um, all kinds of different um, configurations are possible with this. Uh, apart from the hardware, uh, so Spectreworks is kind of one of the companies that, that builds on these open source products um, to, uh, 
offer some uh, for some some drone related services. Um, the uh, software that's used to control this, uh, uh, the big one is called Mission Planner. Um, so this is by ArduPilot. Um, this is a really long running program that lets you do everything from configure the hardware on your drone to uh, uh, flying uh, and controlling the, the, the aircraft in flight, planning missions. Um, extremely powerful software uh, capable of doing just about anything um, that you would want to do. Uh, when you fly, um, you're taking images at certain intervals. Um, so uh, as you're taking photographs, those images are, are tagged with a location. So your drone has a GPS in it. Uh, not all drones have GPSs, by the way. So the very cheap, cheap drones that you might buy for $30 uh, don't. Um, but if you're willing to put down $100 or $200, many of those do have uh, drone, uh, have GPS flight enabled. Uh, as you're taking pictures, if you have got a GPS on board, uh, then those images are going to get tagged with a GPS position. Um, so that's the latitude and longitude, but also the altitude at which you're flying. Uh, in some cases, you have to do the uh, geotagging um, in post-processing. Uh, that's becoming a little less common. Um, the quality of that fix really depends on the quality of your GPS unit. So a consumer-grade GPS chip is capable of positioning you within, let's say, two, three, four meters. Um, if you want to do better than that, you can use some of the newer technology, um, which is called real-time kinematic GPS, which uses a, a paired relay station um, that can receive corrections. So this is sort of similar to how differential GPS worked back in the day. Uh, if you make a, a very accurate comparison with a land station, then those, um, then those uh, beamed corrections um, can get you to within a couple of centimeters uh, of where you are. Um, as you're flying, um, you still are going to need to register your image on the ground. So the GPS tagged images um, do most of the work for that. If you want very fine um, accuracy, then what you would do is you'd place these targets on the ground. Um, so these are ground control point targets. Um, you can make these yourself. You can buy these online. Um, they're basically sort of brightly colored images that let you um, uh, find each, each one um, in an image. And you basically... Uh, survey those points. So you see at the top, there's a tripod with one of the um, uh, points resting right square in the middle of that target. Um, so you take a really high grade survey accuracy GPS system and record the uh, position of that point. And then you would use um, several of these ground control points during post-processing to really finely position your scan. Uh, when you're flying these missions, they're almost never done by hand. Um, so people don't go out and sort of um, pick up the controls and fly the drone around um, themselves. What they do is they program a mission planner. Um, there are lots of these. Um, so this is an example of uh, one of the big software companies' um, mission planners. This is a PIX4D uh, mission planner running on an iPad. Uh, and what you do is you go out there with your, with your iPad, which is uh, set to talk to your drone. Um, you draw a polygon around what it is that you're scanning, and then you need to set a couple of parameters. You need to set the angle of the camera. Um, you'll often set this to 90 degrees, which is pointing straight down, but you might point it a little bit um, above that. Um, you're going to decide how much overlap and side lap that you have. Uh, remember that the quality of your reconstruction is going to depend on how much overlap there is. Too much overlap, uh, and you get a lot of images that are going to take a lot of time to process too little overlap and you're not going to get a quality reconstruction. And so there's sort of a sweet spot. Uh, most people go with these settings or something close to it with about 80% overlap between images uh, front and back and about 70% uh, what's called side lap uh, or side overlap. Um, uh, and you might crank those numbers up to especially 80% side lap if you are um, uh, if you're flying in a particularly difficult environment. Uh, so forest canopies, for instance, you might want to crank that up if you're flying over a pretty easy um, urban area where there's lots of differentiation and, and field uh, and points that you can use, uh, you might be able to set that down to 60%. Uh, the side lap matters particularly um, because the bigger the side lap is, the smaller those um, uh, those uh, lines between, um, so as it, what they're called scan lines or grid lines, as the drone flies along that path, if you have smaller, um, if you need a bigger overlap, the, the distance between those is going to be smaller. And as a result, you're going to have to fly a lot longer. Um, drones have pretty limited flight time. Uh, and so you need to sort of wisely spend that flight time. Um, uh, and so you really want to get that overlap dialed in nicely. Uh, you can also um, configure the drone to fly fast or slow. Uh, generally speaking, you can fly pretty fast. Um, the uh, maximum speed limit for flights in the United States for a drone is 100 miles an hour. Um, but most um, drone flights are done quite a bit slower than that. So it's uh, 
common for drone flights to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 miles an hour, which tends to be a pretty good balance uh, of energy expenditure uh, and time. Uh, just like with a car, the faster you go, the more inefficient the flight is. Um, so you can't just crank the speed up to 100 miles an hour because you're going to burn through your batteries a lot faster. Uh, once you get the images taken, what you do is you put the stuff into photogrammetry software. Um, so this is going to stitch the images together. Um, it's going to extract a point cloud. Um, you can also do a lot more with this. You can create meshes. You can uh, create DSMs and DTMs. So the, the software actually handles most of this pretty, uh, pretty much automatically. You kind of point it to the directory of your geotagged images, uh, and it proceeds through the, uh, through the uh, images, uh, sticking them all together and making the point cloud. Um, the process is almost uh, entirely automatic, um, but if the algorithm makes mistakes, which sometimes it does, you can go back into the um, uh, what's called the Ray Cloud uh, and make adjustments and make fixes. Uh, there are lots of these um, photogrammetric softwares out there. Um, I tend to use one called Pix4D, uh, which I've had pretty good luck with. Uh, another one is Agisoft, um, which a lot of people like. Um, there's some open source versions called Open Drone Map. Um, uh, that's still very much in development, but I would expect that probably within uh, a couple of years, a lot of the open source um, photogrammetric software is going to get pretty good. And then there's Drone Deploy, which is Esri's um, uh, drone software product, uh, but that's actually just Pix4D uh, with sort of an Esri wrapper around it. Um, the, um, the differences between uh, LiDAR-derived point clouds uh, and uh, the photogrammetric-derived point clouds, uh, which are also known as structure from motion, um, the reason for, for this is, uh, or SFM is the abbreviation, is because you are not using stereo images, you're using sequential images. So this is called structure from motion. Um, the advantages to that are that it's, it's relatively fast. Um, it's really easy to pair with uh, um, uh, UAVs, uh, you don't need any special equipment, you just need a camera. Um, you're pulling in uh, RGB or, or color information directly as you're flying, um, so there's no need to post-process that like you've been uh, having to do with, uh, with LiDAR. It works best outdoors, there's no reason why you can't do interior scans with structure from motion using uh, cameras. Um, they just tend to not work as well. Um, terrestrial LiDAR uh, is uh, relatively uh, inexpensive, um, but the stitching together process has been a little bit error prone. Um, so you need a SLAM algorithm um, to do that properly. Those SLAM algorithms um, are often difficult to use. Um, they're kind of designed around the robotics community. Um, but at least terrestrial LiDAR works indoor and outdoor. You can, you can mount these sort of mobile small units on a drone and that works pretty well. Um, the, the, the range tends to be a little bit more limited. Uh, the airborne LiDAR, which you're a little bit more accustomed to, um, this stuff is very expensive to fly uh, if you're doing it um, on a contract basis. But if you uh, just use stuff that's already been flown by your county um, or through another program, then it's obviously free. Um, so airborne LiDAR can either be very expensive or very inexpensive. Um, airborne LiDAR tends to be extremely precise. So one of the things that um, is a disadvantage to photogrammetric point clouds is that they tend to be a little bit noisy. Um, dots end up in places where you wouldn't really want them, and so you really can't just treat it as a, as a fully fleshed um, point cloud model. You have to be very aware that, that, that what you're getting uh, are a lot of artifacts in the image, um, bad points, uh, whereas that's a little less common with, with LiDAR. Um, airborne LiDAR also penetrates through the, through the canopy. Uh, photogrammetry doesn't do that. It's going to stop when it hits a leaf, um, and so you can get shadows and, and occlusions um, that LiDAR could help you um, get around. Uh, LiDAR tends to get pretty poor coverage of building faces, though, uh, and because um, photogrammetric scans from a drone are usually done at relatively low altitude, 400 feet or less, um, you, you do tend to get the, the sides of buildings very well. Uh, and so the reconstruction of those uh, from structure from motion tends to be quite a bit better. Um, you can fly. Um, there are a lot of uh, ways that you can kind of get into this. Drones are relatively inexpensive. Um, even the, uh, uh, the, the kind of low-end drones that are capable of, of doing very good scanning are only a couple of hundred dollars. Um, you can learn to fly uh, with sort of a $30 drone. Um, you may have a hard time sort of getting the imagery that you want. 
uh, and flying the missions because a lot of these don't have, the very cheap drones don't have uh, fully autonomous control. You have to fly them manually, which is harder than you would uh, expect. Uh, anything between about half a pound and 55 pounds uh, is regulated by the FAA. Um, so those have to be registered. Uh, there are additional restrictions that apply to those. Um, the registration is only $5. That's um, uh, just sort of to offset the, uh, the administrative cost of, of running the website. Um, you can go out and, and fly anything under 55 pounds as a hobbyist. Um, you do need to be uh, aware that there are certain restrictions. Um, so you have to fly during daylight. You can't fly higher than 400 feet. You have to keep the drone um, in your view at all times. You need to you need to be uh, fly away from airports. Uh, you can't fly in national parks. And many local restrictions um, uh, exist as well. So Virginia Tech, for instance, has restrictions um, that require you to have what's called a Part 107 remote pilot um, certificate before you can fly on campus. So hobbyists can't just fly um, on most of campus uh, here at Virginia Tech. Uh, if you want to kind of um, be a professional, if you want to accept uh, jobs and sort of fly for a real estate agent or, or whatever, um, you need a professional certification. Um, that certification is called the Part 107 Remote Pilot um, Certification. Uh, it's a $150 exam. Um, it's uh, relatively complicated. You have to know uh, a fair bit about um, piloting in general, how to read uh, aerial, uh, uh, aerial maps designed for pilots. Um, you have to know a lot about airspace, um, so it is it is challenging um, and worth sort of studying. There are a number of sort of online classes you can take and YouTube videos. Uh, and if you're interested in that, um, definitely let me know. Uh, I have my Part 107 Remote Pilot Certificate and have had it for a couple of years. Uh, and it's a, it's a useful thing and, and uh, I think it makes you a safer pilot in general. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll post a link to a, a photogrammetric point cloud that you can download and look at in Cloud Compare. Um, make some comparisons between that and, the, and LIDAR, um, and, uh, and I think you'll find um, uh, there are you know, some real advantages to using photogram photogrammetry to, to generate point clouds. Some drawbacks too, but, but in general, I think that the advantages of, uh, of these things outweigh the, uh, the drawbacks. Thanks very much for listening, uh, and we'll see you next time.